Good evening, everyone. I'm Marcia Cavanaugh. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, New Orleans can claim to be the home of many great artists and one presidential assassin. In this, the week of the 50th anniversary of the Kennedy assassination, we'll look at Lee Harvey Oswald in New Orleans and at the impact that the president's administration had on local politics. We will also examine parishes suing oil companies, restoring barrier islands with BP money, finding a new plan for the Jazz Land site, and what we learned from the Philippines' disaster about tropical systems. Joining us are tonight's informed sources, Errol Laborde, producer of Informed Sources, Mark Schlefstein, environmental reporter, NOLA.com, The Times-Picayune, Dominic Massa, executive producer for Special Projects, WWL-TV Channel 4, and Jaquetta White, reporter, The New Orleans Advocate. Mark, first we're going to move over to you and move over to the coast. There have been more lawsuits filed now regarding our coast, um, suing oil companies. So why don't you sort of describe sure. to us what's going on with that? Well, what's happened is that um, two parishes, uh, Plaquemines Parish and Jefferson Parish, have uh, decided to go ahead and, and file what are called really called legacy lawsuits. And these are lawsuits that are aimed at getting uh, oil, gas, and pipeline companies to deal with environmental problems that they left behind over the last 40 or 50 years. Uh, in a, a lot of cases, these particular lawsuits are going after these companies for uh, their uh, inability to have uh, picked up wastes. Uh, a lot of them would uh, just dump wastes from the drilling operations into pits and just leave them there. Yeah. Um, in other cases, uh, they're going after uh, the fact that these companies were actually had uh, dug canals uh, and um, uh, never filled them back in. And the 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 key piece here that makes this a little bit different from an earlier lawsuit that was filed on behalf of the the Southeast Louisiana Flood Protection Authority East on mm -hmm. the east bank of the river is that these are all aimed at uh, the the coastal zone of of Louisiana, and that's a specific area along the coast that the parishes have the authority of uh, regulating. And for the first time, they're stepping up and saying, you guys have violated all these permits that we all gave you, basically the state and the federal government gave you, and you need to do something about it. Go clean it up. It could be that the companies are going to come back in and do the right thing, so to speak, and uh, uh, come back and see if they can uh, figure out how to negotiate and 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 get this stuff done. Um, uh, a lot of private uh, uh, landowners have already filed similar lawsuits and have been rather successful uh, to the point where the state actually passed a law that requires the Department of Natural Resources to assure that the money that the private landowners get actually is used to clean up and and restore the wetlands. Have What's the, the oil companies... Go ahead. Go no, ahead. I also think that politically these lawsuits have more, more clout too and that these are independently elected governments that are that are filing them, and so people from Baton Rouge have less ability to yank the lawsuits or or fire people and move things around. I I think that uh, I'm I'm not quite sure about the more clout. The reality is that the that the levy authority lawsuit has not ended. Uh, it's still in place, and so the clout is still there. Uh, what's different is indeed uh, in this case you've got elected officials who are filing this these suits, and the governor's made a big deal about that, saying, well, elected officials d did these suits. So, so they're okay as opposed to a, a, an appointed board, uh, none of uh, the members of which I appointed, uh, making a decision about, about whether or not to file suit and doing it without our permission. Um, two things. Have the oil companies been doing any backfill at all in the dredging that they've done with these various canals? Have they been doing that? S some have, but not, you know, we really are talking about a significant amount of, of, of time in which a lot of this stuff was done, you know, 50 years ago, uh, especially in terms of the waste pits. Uh, that's something that the companies would not really want to have gone back out there and tried to clean up because it's so hard to get it. And so that's, it's really going to be interesting to see exactly what gets cleaned up as we move forward with this. Are these suits looked upon as perhaps being a, a vehicle to to drive the oil companies to the bargaining table and really get serious about doing this work? Well, I, I, I'm 
I'm assuming that that is the purpose of it, um, and uh, if so, it will it will provide a, a rather useful stream of money for the parishes, at least those two, uh, for helping out in uh, their own efforts to restore wetlands. So they're seeking either the suits are either seeking compensation or get the work done. Yeah, the basically, other. what 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 happens is that uh, they tell the companies to go back and get and and do the work, and uh, in the traditional legacy lawsuits, uh, the companies then come up with a plan and submit it to the state to make sure that it's approved. Uh, but if the, you know, in some cases, uh, the, the land may be gone. Yeah. And in those cases, they're going to have to um, actually compensate the, the governments for the loss of land. This will be an ongoing story, no doubt. Right. Sure will. Thanks a lot. Jaquetta, uh, Jazzland, its most recent uh, proposed developer has said, mm, never mind, we're not going to do this. What happened there? That's right. So the city, uh, about two years ago, op initiated a public bid process where they opened bids to anyone across the world that wanted to go in and develop this former Jazzland property that didn't reopen after Hurricane Katrina. Uh, got eight bids back in 2011 and selected this company, uh, DAG Development and Provident Realty. Provident's a Dallas company and DAG's based here locally that wanted to put an upscale outlet mall there. The plan fell through because another company, Howard Hughes, has since said that it will open up an outlet mall at the yeah. Riverwalk. And so the developers at the Six Flags sites said it just wasn't feasible for New Orleans to house two outlet malls. So the agreement that that was in place with the city and the industrial development board, is that right? Right. That, that allowed for this group to say, to pull back and not suffer any sort of consequence or anything like that for doing that? Right, so what happened was the, the city awarded a, a lease agreement to DAG and Provident that basically said you can go in for two years and do due diligence. And they had, uh, they were supposed to meet certain requirements every six months. And what in October, that six, the first six month period came and they decided that it just wasn't feasible, yeah, and so they were able to terminate the contract. And, and you know, between this um, proposal and Jazzland, there was a Six Flags attempt, too, that Six Flags was going to go there, and, and, and that didn't work. I think the problem that area has um, is there's some psychological barriers, the first one being the I-10 high-rise, and most of the population center is on the other side of the, the high-rise, and the other is a six-mile bridge, and so people live in St. Tammany. And so for most people, if you're going to something in that area, you have a long bridge, either a high bridge or a long bridge uh, to go over. And so whatever it is, it really has to be a really major draw, and I think the the investors in Jazzland were hoping that would be the case because it would be the only theme park in the area. It, it didn't prove, but it's, but it, it, it's got to be something that really imagines it to sell itself to consumers to go there. Well, the thing is, I don't know that it will work as a consumer site. It may not. It's been getting a lot of demand right now as a, a place to film movies. So it's been it's been booked consistently. There's no month that a movie is not filming there. One of the proposals in the last round was some sort of film studio back lot. Mm -hmm. It just didn't have the financing behind it that made that plan more feasible than the outlet mall. So over the years, there have been a number of ideas that have come forth, but nothing has, has happened. Exactly. So to take a step back, Jazzland opened in, two, in 2000, operated for three seasons, and then uh, was sold in bankruptcy to Six Flags for $22 million. This is a $135 million mm -hmm. theme park that sold for $22 million. And Six Flags operated it for three years, three seasons, until Hurricane Katrina, and did not open after that. Since then, uh, under the Nagan administration, when Arnie Fielko was a councilman, he had courted a company called Big League Dreams that wanted to put a sports complex there. Mayor Nagan uh, was in talks with Nickelodeon to slap its sponsorship on it and reopen it as a theme park. A Minnesota company wanted to reopen it as a theme park. Just all those ideas have fizzled. In this most recent round, there were eight other proposals, but the, the one that has now recently backed off was the one that was selected. Will these eight come forth again, do you think, or be considered again, or is it now a whole new round? This will be a whole new round. I don't, uh, the director of the Industrial Development Board says that he, both he and Amy Quirk, the mayor's uh, advisor for economic mm -hmm. development, have received phone calls from interested parties. I don't know that any of the, the groups that had been in that last round are, are among those. There was a power plant in that group. Um, there was there were more theme parks. There was a film studio. Yeah. Um, maybe they'll come back up, but uh, this is an entirely new new round. At least, at least with a film studio, you eliminate the problem of those big trucks blocking traffic, like when you have when you're shooting in the quarter in Uptown, and so that's uh, something desirable. But the quarter in Uptown is still going to be pretty <laughs> desirable for them. Mark, back to you. The coast is again the state really has been given a bit of money, this is from BP criminal fines now, to begin doing some restoration efforts. Uh, right. What are we getting, how much, and where's it going? Right. So um, 
the uh, both BP and Transocean uh, pleaded guilty to criminal charges uh, involving the Deepwater Horizon accident and oil spill, um, and they uh, they paid uh, in total about five and a half billion dollars in a variety of different fines. About two and a half billion dollars of that money went to the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, which is better known as an organization that puts together land that adds to the size of wildlife refuges and, na and national parks. Uh, in this particular case, though, the money is uh, set aside for projects that are aimed at, at uh, meeting the goals of restoring things that were hurt uh, during the oil spill. And in Louisiana's case, Louisiana actually, as part of the, the, the actual agreement, was given half of that money. And that half of the money must be used for two purposes and two purposes only. And that is uh, to uh, help build, uh, rebuild barrier islands, uh, or barrier headland in one case, and uh, also to build these large uh, diversions of sediment and fresh water uh, to rebuild wetlands. And so the, the, the money is going to be paid out over five years. In the first two or three years, it's fairly small amounts. And so the first $100 million was basically announced uh, uh, earlier this week. Mm -hmm. And of that, uh, the state gets about $68 million, uh, with the biggest chunk going for uh, one diversion that will be on the west bank of the river called the mid Barataria Diversion. And it, it again is aimed at its, it, even though $40 million sounds like a lot of money, that's really a small amount. This is going to be a billion dollar sort of a project. And uh, it's it's going to end up costing a heck of a lot more and take a lot more time. This is the, the startup process. Uh, and, and as, as these, um, as additional money comes in over the next couple of years, that will be added to for those projects. So these first monies really are going to go to planning and design of these right. different projects. The, the, uh, the Myrtle Grove, that's where this mid area diversion is. Is that the one right. that you're referring to? And then also for planning and design for some smaller diversions further down the river. Is that right, correct? right. There, there are, the state has 10 diversions planned that are in its uh, state master plan. Um, and that smaller amount of money will go to uh, three or four diversions that are on the lower part of the Mississippi River. And then another chunk of money will go for uh, planning for the next phase of building two barrier islands, or mm -hmm. one barrier headland in front of uh, Port Fouchon, and the other one is an island to uh, the west of Port Fouchon, West Timbaler. And this is in addition to the monies already being spent, like for Barrier Island restoration. The state's right. already it, spending. It is, and indeed, it's uh, you know this is not going to be the last money that comes mm -hmm. as a as a result of fines. There's more fines that are still sitting out there as part of the the civil trial. Uh, many billions of dollars uh, still to be decided, and a big chunk of that money also will be used. Well, for, for years when this topic brought up, people would talk about it, and they talk about you know losing the football fields every day and that sort of thing. And there never seemed to be a plan, though. It's like nobody ever really knew what to do. Is there a plan now? I mean, yes. is there a consensus about what actually, to do? Actually, there has been a plan since 2007, but yes. it was it was updated in 2012. And the the 2012 plan was more than just hey, this is how we plan to get there. This one is uh, with actual projects that that are in the works or at least we want these kinds of projects to be built on this part of the river. And uh, yeah, it's a 50-year plan. It's $50 billion that the state is estimating it will cost with the understanding that it is, uh, that, that $50 billion will not be enough to do what everybody really wants us to do. Uh, but it will be a, a, a big start over that 50 years. And that Myrtle Grove diversion, the state is still uh, in line when they want to begin construction of it in 2015? 2015 is when they hope to do, hope to get uh, construction started. And, and that uh, project will have a combination of money. Uh, this, this piece of money will help with the planning, but the state has other money that's available okay. from uh, uh, surpluses from previous years of the state budget that it's already set aside to help build. And we might know if there is opposition to this, to, to among There's, fisher and There are, are, are significant arguments amongst commercial fishermen mm -hmm. about what the effects are of these diversions, with a lot of them looking at uh, older freshwater diversions rather than sediment diversions. 
concerns and saying that they did not work and uh, concerns about what will happen to commercial fisheries in the future. And it's an ongoing battle to save our coast, no doubt. Thanks, Mark. Dominic. This week, um, if anybody's turned on the television set anywhere, certainly they've seen pieces about the assassination of John F. Kennedy, uh, Kennedy his, many, his, many, uh, many. Yeah, his administration's <laughs> legacy. And, and a lot of these, um, these different documentaries and stories and such, um, of course, we're seeing um, Lee Harvey Oswald in there, and we're hearing the mention mm-hmm. of New Orleans. That's because Lee Harvey Oswald has a close connection to New Orleans. Tell us about it. Born here. That's pretty close. That's That's a pretty close close. connection. Uh, I will say our colleague Bruce Nolan, who uh, with The Advocate is doing some stories in Sunday's uh, newspaper, he had a good point that second, a third to Dallas and D.C. is New Orleans. And all these documentaries you've seen, the the other Mm -hmm. city, one of the other cities that comes out a lot in all of this is New Orleans because of the Lee Harvey Oswald connection. And then uh, four years later, because of the Clay Shaw indictment and trial uh, under District Attorney Jim Garrison. So that put New Orleans in the spotlight again. But yes, Lee Harvey Oswald was born in New Orleans. Uh, I should say I'm working on some stories. Right. To add to the glut of programs about JFK <laughs> will be Channel 4. We're doing a couple of, of stories next week on this because it is you know, such a huge story. And New Orleans plays a, a key role in that. But Lee Harvey Oswald was born in New Orleans, 1939, went to school here. I had a troubled family life. So there were early signs that he, you know, that things weren't 100% with his mother. His father died right before he was born. Uh, he was in and out of you know, different homes. They moved around in the Ninth Ward. Um, and then he lived uh, right before the assassination in, in 1963 with his wife then uh, on Magazine Street uh, in, in, a, in a home there. So he, you know, was very much a New Orleanian then. He moved away in between, went to Dallas, right. to back he and forth. He lived in Texas Soviet for a while Union, as a child, right. too, didn't Texas, he? correct. So, and New York for a short period of time. His school, school age years, though, he was here. So what school did he go to? Warren Easton, Beauregard Junior High and then Warren Easton. Uh, only for a year at both, so mm-hmm. that's the dubious distinction of being, you know, and a then student also there. He wound up in the Soviet Union at, at some point. He defected to there. Correct. And, and in one of my stories, I say, you know, that's the whole other part of the story. Let's focus on the New Orleans because mm-hmm. there is so much else out there that you can, you know, obviously that is being being discussed. But the New Orleans uh, connections. Then in the summer of '63, very visible here. Uh, he was filmed. First of all, he, he got into a scuffle with some uh, anti-Castro, uh, some Cuban refugees because he was the pro-Castro side, the Fair Play for Cuba committee, and uh, handing out leaflets on Canal Street mm-hmm. and then by the uh, old International Trademark Building, uh, Camp and Common. And so he was filmed, you know, by news crews, television crews, uh, and then that film was shown. He was on an interview. Bill Slatter interviewed him on WDSU, mm-hmm. you know, talking about whether you're, are you a Marxist or you're a communist. And so that, that clip you've seen a lot in a lot of the documentaries right. because that was one of the few clips they had of who is this person. And the story just there of the footage that was, that was uh, shot and was almost thrown away because in those days film was not kept at all. It was expensive to yeah. keep film, and so it was a throwaway process of every few weeks we're going to dump, you know, dump that film. Well, do you guys November 22nd, we do. We do. Mm-hmm. Okay, Actually, so we'll see it. Yeah. in the answer to Bill Slada's question, he seemed to be ideologically all over the place, yeah. because on the one hand, he's, uh, he shows signs of being a communist, and he's, and he's taking up uh, Castro's cause. On the other hand, the guys he's hanging around with right. in New Orleans and all the, all the meetings and all the parties he's going to are anti-communist and anti-Castro people. As you've seen with all these programs and all, all the history, it's hard to put a finger on yeah. you know what yeah, is going on. There is, I guess, some indication that he, things were not 100 percent. So they, you know, you can tell that <laughs> obviously he had some some issues, and he was, you know, even even as a young younger person, that his his uh, in school, you know, no real friends, no real sort of a loner, and so. So the Garrison and trial that. and Clay Shaw also that came about That's because 19, of Lee Harvey Oswald. 1967. Okay. Uh, we really came about because of Jim Garrison's fanciful imagination, most mm-hmm. people would say. And so that, uh, as Rosemary James, who covered it last night, CNN had a great program, and she was interviewed for that, mm-hmm. and said it was just a carnival, it's a circus atmosphere. And, you know, nowadays, when you say a trial like that, a, a circus, this was really, you know, one of the one of the classic ones, and again, brought the media spotlight to New Orleans. Uh, in that CNN program last night was a great clip of Garrison on Johnny Carson. And that's one of the national venues where he first, you know, talked about what he had and, and what was going to, what was going to come. Uh, the trial lasted six weeks, and uh, Clay Shaw was put on trial, very prominent businessman, and probably the last person anyone would associate with something like this. Uh, but it took only an hour for the jury then to say yeah, not guilty. So that yeah. shows you. And one other thing I wanted to mention, which we'll mention in our story, is Archbishop Hannon's role in, in JFK's life and in his death. He uh, said the eulogy at his funeral uh, as a bishop in D.C. So he, he figures into the story as well. So there's a lot of, uh, of New Orleans connections to, to the story. You know, I remember several years ago, you all remember Richard Angelico, the investigative mm-hmm. reporter, and, and he was certainly could, could be as cynical as any investigative reporter could be. And 
he, he believed that Oswald acted alone, as, as I do, frankly. And the point that, that he made, and I guess this was five years ago or maybe 10 years ago, he says, by now, he says, you've had the, the, all the world's press all these years. Anyone can win a Pulitzer Prize or something by proving otherwise, and nobody has ever been able to do it by now. And now with all the types of forensic evidence you have. Mm -hmm. But still, you can look at any place and see lots of little bits and pieces, okay? As you can in New Orleans. And another fact that we didn't mention was Carlos Marcello. That's true. Out of New Orleans, too. And, he and, figures a lot into the and, conspiracy. Uh, and, and, and Bobby Kennedy um, playing to the, uh, uh, the deporting Marcello. And so if you want to put together a conspiracy, if you want to, even if it didn't exist, mm -hmm. but, if you, but if you want to see a lot of pieces mm -hmm. that New Orleans between Marcello and Jim Garrison and, and Oswald being, uh, being married, I mean, uh, being born here, uh, certainly had the pieces. Mm -hmm. Right, and the stories and the books keep coming out, too. And, of course, we'll take a look at your stories next mm -hmm. week on WWL. And Errol, I wanted to ask you, JFK's administration, what kind of impact did it have on our local politics? It had a huge impact. Um, I don't think by any ideological intent, but, but, you know, New Orleans during that time was still regarded as, like, the American city that was the gateway to Central America. It, that had been a role that the city had played for a long time, especially when the days when the, when the shipping was more important before... Um, Aviation came in, and so it was still called itself the gateway to the Americas. I think uh, Miami and Houston probably have a more rightful claim to that title now, but back then uh, it was. And uh, Kennedy appointed Deliceps Morrison, who was in his fourth term as mayor of New Orleans, to be ambassador to the Organization of American States. Now, you're not going to have fourth term mayors anymore because halfway during Morrison's term, they passed the a city charter in 54, and so now all mayors are limited to two terms. But Morrison was able to run for two more terms, and so in his fourth term, he was elected. And so he had been a mayor almost 16 years, and so he really had been a dominant figure. So once Kennedy appointed Morrison to be the ambassador, that left for the first time. I mean, their kids spent all their whole life with teenagers who had never well, seen a mayor, Morrison, yeah. okay, other than Morrison. And the city charter allowed for an interim mayor to be selected among the two council members at large. And there was this famous meeting when the two council members at large, there was this meeting in the boathouse in the lakefront, and this guy, uh, Jimmy Comiskey, was trying to get the vote for him. And then Vic Skiro, who had been the senior council at large, he shows up. Well, anyway, Skiro was elected interim mayor, served out Morrison's term, and then went on to be elected to two four-year terms. And so he served almost 10 years as mayor. So that appointment really just... I guess it changed the tone, uh, it changed the players in New Orleans politics. And every mayor since then, every mayor since the charter has, uh, has been passed, has been elected to two four-year terms. Uh, and so we've had, even though maybe they one or two we shouldn't have been, but, but uh, and so we haven't had many mayors in New Orleans. I, I mean, uh, the mayor's office has been, uh, been very stable. But I think that that one appointment was very important. Uh, of course, uh, Ted Kennedy. Uh, over his career, uh, became close to the Reggie family, and, and, and right. you know, he married into it. Yeah. Um, so, he, uh, he married into New it. Orleans Kennedy connections in, in more than one way. Yes. Yeah. And Kennedy it's visited it's here it's several times, too. People yeah, remember he did. the 60s. Just so. a mm -hmm. significant time in history, this 50th anniversary mm -hmm. of his assassination. There was, Mark, a huge storm that hit the Philippines um, last week. And I think we have an image of the size of that storm over the Philippine Islands. What, what are we learning? What do we learn about the size of this huge, huge storm and how it relates to communities like ours? Well, this, this really is a super, super, this was a super typhoon. That's what they call these huge typhoons that form in the Pacific Ocean. And, and the reality is that in the Pacific, you have the ability of these much larger storms occurring. This one had top sustained winds of 195 miles an hour. And gusts to 235 miles Can an hour. It's like that here? it's that like a you know a, it's like a tornado. Yeah. I mean it's it's really that large. You see and, it covering uh, the entire Philippines, which is right. Yeah, see that right. I mean it, it, it really was was huge. And the the reality was that it it was a killer of a storm, and it was uh, very similar in its effects to what happened uh, here in New Orleans. Although you know that there it was the water from the storm hitting. The area, uh, which did not have the protections of levees to protect those cities, um, as opposed to here. Um, 
And the, as of this afternoon, the, the death toll in, uh, in the Philippines is up to officially 2,360, uh, and there's 77 missing. Let me ask you, is this the largest storm that's ever been recorded in that part? No, it's no. not. And, uh, but it, it's, it's the largest that may have hit a land mass. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, that's, you know, I think that's the key one. And, you know, unfortunately, one of the realities is that there probably are many larger storms that were out there prior to satellites. And we are, yeah. you know, the satellite history began in the 1960s. So there are lots of storms that were out there prior to that that yeah. may have actually caused but significant But being there damage. out in the middle of an ocean and we're not, are we as likely to get ever get a storm that big? Not that big, but but we still have the ability of getting a, you know, a major Category 5 storm, a storm the size of Sandy, but a stronger storm. Uh, that definitely has the ability. What I think uh, a lot of people have been focusing on this storm about, uh, and it's the same sort of uh, discussion that came up after Sandy, is so how does this fall into the idea that global warming is occurring, that uh, climate change is affecting these storms? And the reality is that, um, the, most of the science right now that we've seen over the last four or five years has come to the conclusion that what we're going to see over the next hundred years is maybe a 15 percent increase in the in the intensity of hurricanes, but not in in the number of uh, it's not going to be an increase in the number of hurricanes. But if, if I can just jump in, I mean, this image definitely just reminds us that we have to learn to be a more sustainable community, build up our wetlands and multiple lines of defense. We're going to need to wrap up right now, and I want to go around and say what is in the future. Tomorrow's election day uh, in Orleans and Jefferson and surrounding parishes. There's uh, a lot of judicial so runoffs and, and, and small runoffs and some referendums. And of course, the big election in Louisiana is the um, fifth congressional uh, district race in the central part, central part of the state. It's among two Republicans, but it's going to kind of help identify which way the Republican Party is going between the Tea Party Republicans and the middle of the road right. Republicans. Mark. Well, I'm going to jump ahead quite a bit to September 4th through 7th of next year when the Society of Environmental Journalists will be bringing their annual conference here to New Orleans to look at risk and resiliency issues and uh, coastal restoration and uh, the potential for storms uh, and what it could do to the United and States. And that's a big issue that we've been considering and building on here. Dominic. One of the other parts of my job is election coverage. Mm -hmm. So uh, this week marked one month till qualifying for the spring elections. Mayor, council, sheriff, there'll be some hot ones there. Mayor, maybe not so much, but certainly those. And the other thing that's interesting is the election will be the day before Super Bowl Sunday again, like again. we were four years oh, ago. My goodness. So we're let's see if repeat of anything that, right? yes, <laughs> repeat in what ways. We'll see. But, Thanks, yeah. um, Traqueta. If you live uptown, you've noticed that between on Napoleon, between Carondelet and Laurel, the crepe myrtles have disappeared, yes. and you're settling in for three years of construction as the Sewerage and Water Board and Army Corps get ready for a drainage project. I know, and goodbye to the trees, and a good evening to you guys. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you for being with us, and we hope to see you again next week on Informed Sources. Good evening. Mm -hmm.